Hello, I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of reInvent, the media company driving these conversations on the future work, future platform economies, and other things. And I'm here with Laura Tyson. What a great uh, opportunity to talk to her. She is the distinguished professor of the Graduate School. She's the director of the Institute for Business and Social Impact at the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business, among many other things. So, so great to have a moment here with you. Thank you, Peter. So we're in this, we're, we're kind of at the tail end of a two-day gathering here mm -hmm. that, why don't you explain, like, what are we in the middle of here <laughs> in terms of this project <laughs> okay. that you're, you're in the center of? And that. So I would say uh, about, uh, you know, six months ago, uh, eight months ago, I had a conversation with some, a few of my colleagues who are longstanding colleagues uh, at the university, uh, and we were really talking about the future of work, which is a topic that is actually engaging think tanks, governments, unions, companies around the world. So each of us were working on that problem in a slightly different way. I had just finished a, a chapter in a book uh, of essays on Thomas Piketty's work on income mm -hmm. inequality. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at this issue of automation and technological change and its effect on income inequality. Uh, some of my colleagues in engineering were looking at both the upsides and the downsides of artificial intelligence, whether it's some of the broader, uh, say, upsides in health or the negative possibilities in employment. So we had a conversation, and we really decided that given what was going on at the campus, we wanted to form an interdisciplinary research group, a community, to share ideas to put together proposals for funding. And part of the sharing of ideas was actually to host some really interesting conversations. Now, also what had happened more than a year ago, and I wasn't at that meeting, uh, the OECD had been talking to the Dean of Engineering about coming to the Berkeley campus and talking about all the work. They do this work. It's across, cutting across several of their major divisions. They're working on the future of work. So we agreed to host this meeting with them. Uh, they've made presentations, and we've made presentations trying to sort of understand uh, where each, where our interdisciplinary faculty group is working, where they're working, where we can share information and perhaps do work together. And so we've had a couple of days here. You've been immersed in it. You're soon going to sum it up. Uh, well, how have you, what have you thought about what, what's been accomplished here? Oh, I think I think it's been actually a very. It, I think it's been a great meeting in terms of content. I, I tend to judge meetings and maybe my professorial hat. So I go to a meeting. I will judge them by what I've learned. <laughs> I think this was a terrific meeting in terms of serious content, and all of that content is going to be shared with all of the participants. So you walk away with some additional information, some additional insight, which will infuse the work you do. Um, I think that it was also actually very good for the OECD, and they would say this, to be able to bring together their major directors, whether they're in employment or economics or social policy or education policy, to talk about this cross-cutting theme. Uh, we were able to bring, um, say, perspectives from the venture capital community to the discussion, was it not something they might normally have the opportunity to discuss. So I think that uh, the participants really came to share information, to get some additional networks uh, that would be important for them going forward, and I think those goals were accomplished. I do too, from what I've actually been able to, mm -hmm. to see of it. Um, but let's pull, pull back a little bit here. We've been asking a lot of folks here of, of to what extent how they see this moment in history, you could even think of it. I mean, in, in terms of the evolution yes. of the global economy, where our technologies are, what's happening in our politics. How, when you think about it, how, how do you talk about the kind of juncture we're at here? So I um, remember a few years ago at the World Economic Forum, that's how I got involved in this, uh, was really from a conversation of a luncheon that McKinsey Global Institute had. I was sitting in the back of the room. I did not have a panel position. I was kind of taking notes, and it was about it was about the, the book that had just come out by Brun Hilson and McAvee, uh, the, the, the Second Machine Age. Great book. And everyone in the room, very obsessed with technology, was sort of talking about the speed, the unexpected speed with which technology was changing work 
and changing skills and automating away jobs and, and worry about the employment effects. And um, I believe, so one of the people on the panel said, well, we'll just have to have very rapid change in social policy. And Tom Friedman, who was the moderator, saw me in the back of the room and he said, well, Laura's been involved in public policy. Do you think there's going to be a rapid change? And I said, this is the most, I said, I'm just in despair here because the notion that we're going to have rapid change in the right direction, given what you're saying is happening with the technology, I, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening. I think there's a terrific irony about the fact that we have had this meeting today when the U.S. has just, the Senate has just passed a tax bill, which in every feature, every feature, is actually going in the wrong direction relative to this. I, you know, I happen to be a supporter, and I'm one of the, it was odd for me, given my party affiliations, of reducing the corporate tax rate in the United States. I think it's important. I think those firms are going to invest more. But I'm not at all sure they're going to invest more in ways that generate a lot of jobs, because you're going to invest in this technology. And the technology per unit of output is not employing that many people. So basically, we may get investment, we may get growth. What is the distribution of the productivity benefits? What's the distribution of the income benefits? What's the distribution of the jobs? I don't think, and by, by passing a, a, a major tax bill which denudes the government of money, uh, all the stuff we're talking about throughout this meeting, the need for more training, the need, <laughs> the need for more early childhood education. We just heard about the importance of that, which I know, I've seen, I've seen the neuroscience literature. You've got to do something on early childhood education. We don't have a public policy in the United States for that. And we've just taken away a bunch of money from the federal government, and we're going to take it away from the progressive states like California who want to do it, or New York want to do it, and say, sorry, can't do it, no money. So I have to say there's a kind of depressing irony of, or something about being here to discuss these issues uh, and realizing that at least one of the major players here is moving a step away from what needs to be done. So I mean, honestly, I've been offline here for this. So that actually went through today. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, uh, I was at least holding out a little bit of hope there that <laughs> there might be some t right. turmoil. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's, I mean, you've hit it on the head here. And we, it is, there is a large amount of irony here. Um, and you were implicit here. We didn't introduce you this way, but with your role in the Obama administration, you have kind of been in the very seat of power and understanding. So I was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Clinton, and then the chair of the NEC. And then I did a couple of... Um, of the business commissions for President Obama. Yeah. So in his first term, he had two business commissions, yeah. and I was involved in both of those. And I know you're just digesting what's going on outside here, but but how are you processing <laughs> that disconnect? <laughs> Let's just say, or, or help the rest of us kind of. Well, I think. I or think how do you start right, to think so here, about here's it? Here's one of the things that I am doing, and I think one 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 of the strengths I said to the to the Europeans, to the OECD people today is, you know, there are some quite interesting things going on at the level of states in the United States. And we then were talking about, in general, that some of these uh, issues about training, about how you run uh, labor markets to make them more flexible, about how you help people with, say, early childhood education, some of those can be done, and I think in the U.S. system are likely to be increasingly done at the level of the state. So what is um, disconcerting about t today is that basically uh, the states that do a lot or want to do a lot in these kinds of areas are going to find it much more difficult to do that because of the change in the deductibility of state and local taxes. I have to go beyond that to say that I still think that progressive states uh, and cities are going to continue to grapple with this. Um, we talked a lot about, um, in this issue of job displacement and job creation, so an optimism point for me here is I, I just finished doing work with McKinsey on their newest report called Jobs Lost, Jobs Gained. Mm -hmm. And our estimate is actually for most places, including the United States, 
Um, if you project forward uh, areas where people are like to, likely to demand more in health, say, or in, um, in health, in uh, care for the elderly, in, in education, that there will be people who want more and that that may create more jobs in those areas. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, there look like there may be enough jobs so a lot of our jobs may disappear between now and 2030, but a lot of ones may be developed because people want to demand goods and services. They want more of those things. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's good. Um, I think that um, where the job destruction occurs and where the job creation occurs are oftentimes different places. And what we heard about uh, very powerfully from uh, Governor Granholm, Jennifer Granholm, is you know when there was obvious job destruction going on in the middle of the country, and there were no exit strategies. There was no fun. There was no funding or jobs coming in, and there was no support for people who might want to or need to leave. Okay. Now, that remains a real issue: where the jobs are being lost and where the jobs might be created. I will say, however, we do have um, a uh, the largest percentage of Americans now live in cities. Uh, we're actually moving more and more as the other developed countries are, and as developing countries have moved to urban settings. Urban settings are much better in the sense because there's a much more diverse set of employment possibilities. And there are usually lots of educational institutions uh, that are around to kind of support this movement from a job disappearing to a job being created. Um, not to mention the fact that most urban centers in the United States are now progressive, meaning they want their government to do mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I put all that together and say, well, those are a couple of sources of optimism here, mm -hmm. that we, we can mm -hmm. believe that there are jobs out there to be created. The government can play a role in that. Active governments uh, with, with the will to do so, uh, a state government, a local government. We heard from uh, one of my, uh, my colleagues that I work with, uh, Lenny Mendonca, about the Western Governors uh, University. I mean, there are some amazing uh, experiments uh, that actually Western Governors University has been around for a while now, where they're actually at scale at a relatively low rate offering a high quality mm -hmm. college degree program, mm -hmm. okay? I mm -hmm. think those things will uh, continue to happen. It's just gonna be harder. It's gonna be harder. <laughs> I hear you and I share that um, um, fear, but now we're sitting here in California, UC Berkeley campus, yeah. um, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, to what extent do you think California, um, not just the urban center, but just as a state, uh, mm -hmm. super majorities, progressive supermajorities. Right. To what extent do you think California could crack a different model around these economic, future work, mm -hmm. labor, well, automation think, issues? Look, it's a very big, it's a very big, very diverse economy. And as a very big, very diverse economy, I think California does have the opportunity to do that. We actually do have a very powerful, uh, with a long history of success, community college system. We actually do have a very powerful and long history of success uh, state college system, and we have the university system. Though those systems, we, we all recognize at each level of that, ed that powerful educational set of institutions, we all recognize that we need to rethink what we're teaching, how we're teaching, um, what should be our links, how can we strengthen the links with the ultimate employers for whom we're providing education to the individual. The individual is looking for pathways and networks and, and jobs, uh, understandably, and so uh, strengthening those links between the, the employers, the, the private sector and the university are very important. So I, I think we have a really good organizational structure in place, and I think we have a really firm commitment to maintain these things. So we have to deal with the flex, the future of education as the future of work evolves, is basically what and I would you're say. In, you're in the, both, in, in the middle of both. 
Well, we're also kind of home of the technology industry, and yes. Um, yes. kind of as we're so you know the most valuable companies in the world right now, right. Are right. platform companies that are based here in the West Coast. Um, to what extent uh, this rise of the platform economy? Uh, to what extent do you think it's put new responsibilities? On the tech community, do you mm -hmm. see any kind of leadership that you would really would like to see from <laughs> them in any kind of way, or do you have any expectation about that? That might also be a piece of the problem, mm -hmm. piece of the puzzle here. Well, you know, I I, I do know that this uh, there's a new partnership for artificial intelligence that's been formed, uh, funded uh, significantly by large contributions from these companies that are now trying. I think that for a variety of reasons, whether it's um, whether you can believe the news on them, whether you're worried about uh, your child's addiction to, to playing games or using the system, whether you're worried about their employment policies and their treatment of women. The, the tech companies right now, uh, you know, maybe 12 months ago, you, you didn't hear the public going, wait a minute, what's going on here? But they, they I think now, on a variety of different uh, questions are being looked at critically. Mm -hmm. So they're forming a partnership. And what I would suggest to the, them is be, be fairly specific about the problems you want to try to solve. And you really should think about the tr training issue. Um, I used in the conversation upstairs that when we were talking about the tech companies, not a platform company, but if you take, uh, if you look at this, the dramatic success of Apple, um, I remember when I was on that commission for with President Obama, President Obama said to Steve Jobs, "Why do you put all of your so many engineering jobs?" Was what he was talking about abroad. And Steve Jobs said, you, we do not have the scale of that in the United States. We don't have the right level of engineering training. He wasn't talking about the very top. He was talking about the middle. We don't have the scale. I can't wait around to train it. I'm, I'm, I have to have my job someplace else. That's it. I can't, I can't do it. It's not my training problem. I'm responding to the absence of talent by going someplace else. And of course, then if you look at Apple's entire organization. So you could say that this was about engineering jobs, OK? But they obviously also, most of their production jobs were outsourced to, uh, to very large entities like Foxconn. Um, they've outsourced most of their janitorial work, uh, just mm -hmm. another. So they, they've actually, uh, you have to go back and say, so what's your talent development plan here? Because their talent, they recruit highly talented individuals, no doubt. A lot of them come from places like Berkeley and Stanford and Harvard and, and the University of Ohio. And I mean, you know, basically the, the, the universities are training people. They go into the, but I have to say, it's an interesting question for the companies to ask themselves. What is their responsibility for training? If they feel there's an absence of talent, do they then try to say, well, I'll just go try to find it someplace else? Do they say, I will try to develop it? Um, I will try to help workers move from one job up the skill ladder? I'm, a, I'm on the board of AT&T, and I'm very proud of what AT&T is doing, mm -hmm. because they have put in place all of these nano degree uh, courses. And they've said to the, the workforce, we see the skills you need over the next five years going this way. We've put together these courses for you. Udacity is offering them. Hmm. Take them. Take them. These are their own employees yeah. or not, or outside people as well? Uh, they, they started with their own employees. I, I actually probably, Udac I don't know at this point whether Udacity is also offering, but but they work with Udacity. Mm -hmm. So they, And they also worked, there's, a, there's also a master's program with, uh, the, with uh, the University of Georgia. I think, or maybe Georgia Tech. I have to that one. I can't. With one of the one mm -hmm. of the great institutions in Georgia, there is a master's program, and it's online and it's designed by the university and AT&T. Mm -hmm. Now, I just use that as an example of you have to have. We're in the in the future of work. We're talking about time frames of maybe ten years, maybe twenty years. So people like the McKinsey study was out to twenty thirty. Okay, if you can see. 
what's likely to be the technology space you're in over the next five to 10 years. And you can already see, given how fast the skill situation is changing, what your workers need. You can help them get those skills. You can invest in them. You can provide training for them. So I would basically say to the tech companies, well, hey, <laughs> what are you doing in this area, right? A good, a worthy challenge. Well, uh, even though it is today, um, I've asked everyone this about the final question. Just how confident are you that we're going to manage this transition in a way that's going to work for everybody uh, and that eventually okay. through, through this we'll, we'll make it through this? Or to what extent are you really, really concerned that we're, we're going to have a real problem on our hands? So I would say uh, right now I saw a recent statistic that something like 87% of Americans surveyed in the by Pew, said they expected that continued technological change would lead to continued income inequality. That is my, I think they're right. I think unless we do anything in a whole set of policies to address that, we, we already know, in a sense, what's going to happen, because the last 30 years have already told us what's going to happen, OK? We, we hollow out the middle. We, for those people who have the right skills, usually higher education, sometimes a tertiary education, not just secondary, tertiary, and you know, master's and doctor's degrees, they're complemented by the technology, meaning the, comp the technology augments their skills, or the technology can't be done without them. I mean, it can't be done without them, OK? So you get job growth and income growth there. You get all of those professional software engineers, they're constantly moving from firm to firm. Their price is bid up all the time because uh, those skills are complemented by the technology. So the middle erodes. People who, who might have been in the middle slide down to lower income jobs uh, towards the bottom. And that's what we've seen that over the past 30 years. And I don't see without serious changes in policy why that would not continue to be the case. Well, that's a sobering but an accurate uh, I hope way it's not, to wait. I hope it's not accurate, uh, but, well, I, but it well, is. Well, <laughs> well, not accurate for, for kind of probably at least where we are at this minute. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But I really appreciate you spending the time with us to kind of sum up what's awesome gathering here and also uh, the moment we're in here. OK. So thank you. My optimism, though, I want to end with just, just to say, Let's, I think California, there are some states that can try to turn this around a little bit. They're big enough and bold enough. And even though the income inequality is a problem in, the United, in California, for example, we just uh, have made our earned income tax credit more generous. There are things states can do. So I, I, do. I, I totally agree with that. And uh, so we'll say maybe yeah. California is the future. Maybe California, working with those, you know, we have the companies here. We need to work with them. Okay, they're right there. They're right here with us. Let's work together with them. Couldn't agree more. Okay. Thank All you. All right, great.